the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. In Jesus, we too are blessed to be a blessing. In this series, we will look at five everyday ways to love our neighbours and change the world. We begin with prayer, we listen, we eat, we serve, and we share our story. This is Bless. So it's a delight to be able to share with you this morning this series on Bless. Five every days, uh, five everyday ways to love your neighbour and change the world. And uh, as I say, it's based on a book. The book's on Kindle. If you want to jump ahead and, you know, it's like BBC iPlayer. You can skip a few episodes ahead and see what's coming. But, uh, and, and the overriding theme, if you've missed, if, you, if you're just catching up, is, uh, as, as the, the video said, that we are blessed to be a blessing. You know, with the blessings that we have received, when we think about our own circumstances, our own journey, you know, that God reached out to us when we were lost. He, he, he came after us and then we experienced his saving grace, his forgiveness. We have our eternal future secured and we've got that assurance and the strength and all the things that we have, all the good things that God has given us, even that, you know, our families, our friends, our jobs, our homes. We've got many, many blessings and, and we, we can bless others. We can bless others through how we have been blessed. And, and there's the three aspects uh, which you'll see. There's begin, we've done B and L, begin in prayer, listen, eat, and then we've got serve and story coming up. And, and what I'm keen to point out is not a, this isn't a linear process. You know, this isn't, a, 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 so if you've not, say for example, somebody comes up and asks you tomorrow to share your story and share, you know, share a bit about your story. You don't have to say, well, I'm really sorry, I'm going to have to go home and pray for you and then we'll have to, I'm going to have to listen to you for a bit and then we're going to have to go out and get a burger and then I'm going to have to maybe do you hoovering and, and then I can share my story. Just share your story. These are principles. These are, this is about having a mindset when we go about to be aware. It's about sort of tuning our spiritual radar to what God is doing and, and looking at it practically about how we can bless others. And I, I think for me... I would love to have had this or heard about this 20 years ago or maybe 30 if I'm being realistic because when I, back when I was a student there was a big thing about, about evangelism. I don't know if when you grew up in church and, and I knew it was something I was supposed to be doing and I felt probably quite guilty about that I wasn't doing it and I felt that, that telling people about Jesus was something for sort of spiritual heavyweights, you know, and that you had to have some sort of um, you know, serious spiritual muscles before you could do this kind of stuff. Um, but it's not that. It's not that at all. Um, you know, I was terrified that I was going to have to accost people at bus stops and ask them if they were washed in the blood of the lamb and stuff like that. And, you know, that God was going to get me to do stuff like that. And I remember going down to Birmingham when I was a student. We worked for a student organization called the Navigators, uh, which many of you will know about, and that's where I met Jenny, so I'm thankful to the Navigators for that, uh, amongst many things. And um, so we worked for a year, and I was sent down to Birmingham as part of this program that we were doing to be, to be um, encouraging. They were having a mission down at university, and our job was to go and encourage the people down there, encourage the students down there that were Christians to kind of get involved in that. And that was good fun, but I found myself in a room with a young guy who was just in the door at uni, and he was absolutely petrified of this. And, 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 and nobody had really, the, the, there was a real pressure on him to invite his flatmates to come along to a Christian event. And I'm not saying that was wrong. You know, the heart behind it was good. Of course, of course we wanted people to come along and hear this speaker, but it really felt for him that he, he, he hadn't even really spoken to his flatmates. He hadn't really even had a conversation. I'm not even really sure they, they knew he was a Christian. I, I, he hadn't really built that relationship. And I just really felt for the guy that he was under this pressure, but he didn't really know how to get from where he was, moving into his flat, to a position where he was built a relationship and he could open up. And he might be able to invite these flatmates along. And so I wished I'd had this 
for him. And maybe you're in that position, you think, well, well I couldn't do this. But believe me, this is for everyone. You know, God has given you not only a story, he's given you so many blessings in your life. And it would be wrong, wouldn't it? It would be wrong to keep them to ourselves. So thanks, God. Thanks for all those blessings. I'm just going to keep a hold of those just now and not, let, not share those with anybody. If we know anything uh, about experience in our relationship with Jesus, that is not the character of God. And that's not the spirit he's put within us. So here we are on week three, which I'm delighted to say is the letter E for eat. Hooray! And, and the whole, the, the concept or the, the sort of thing to have in your mind today is, is that to bless our neighbours, Jesus invites you to eat with them, which sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, I love eating. I don't know about you. I enjoy eating. You might be able to see that by looking at me. That's why I wear check shirts a lot of the time. It, it confuses the eye when you're looking at, at this and distracts you from what's really going on. Um, so... I don't have any samples. We're not going to actually hand out pizzas today. Apologies for that. But we're going to feast on God's word. Hey, how about that? And uh, we're going to look at a particular passage from the life of Jesus. And this passage is from the book of Matthew. And interestingly enough, um, the passage we're going to read is talking about Matthew himself. It's Matthew's sort of, a wee bit of Matthew's story, his testimony about a significant moment in his life where Jesus reached out and called him. So we're going to read this. It's in Matthew. If you're following along, it will come on the screen. But if you're following along or taking notes, we're looking at Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 to 13. And I'll read it out. It's the calling of Matthew. And it says, As Jesus went from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, Many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And on hearing this, Jesus said, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Or as one translation puts that last sentence, and I like the way it puts it, for I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. So this morning, we're going to look at three areas. It's a three-courser uh, in our meal, and we're going to look at three areas of how eating together can make a huge impact. We're going to look at how we can be involved how we need to be open and how we need to be available. Those are the three things we're going to look at. And the first thing is we're going to look at how we need to be involved. Let's get around the table. Let's get around the table. Now, many of us will have a favourite table. Maybe it's a table at a restaurant, a table at a coffee shop. Maybe it's a table, a family table, a place where you've had fond memories and, and good friendships, good conversation, good times. And there's a real power in eating with people, isn't there? There's a real power in eating with others. I believe that something special happens when we gather around the table. Something special happens when we gather around the table, doesn't it? And it's, it's about a month to Thanksgiving. I think it's a month tomorrow to Thanksgiving in the, the, the United States. And you might have heard, it's, it's done the rounds it's been for a few years now, the story about uh, two people called Jamal and Wanda who have a particularly good Thanksgiving story. Uh, in 2016, Wanda, who's a grandmother, had meant to text her Thanksgiving plans to her grandson. But unknown to her, her grandson had changed his mobile phone and his number had been reassigned to a young 17-year-old chap called Jamal. And he got the message. And to and fro a bit with the texts, they realised that there'd been a misunderstanding. But and I can, you know, based on my own experience of hungry 17-year-olds, the young guy chanced his arm and said, is there any chance I could come for Thanksgiving dinner anyway? <laughs> to that, eh, Wanda's response was, of course you can. That's what grannies do. They feed everyone, which I think is true. So now Jamal has been going to Wanda's house for seven years eh, for Thanksgiving. It's become a thing 
Uh, and uh, they've gone through the ups and downs of life. Wanda's husband passed away a few years ago and Jamal went over and he was there. And they've become really good friends. And they're actually, I think, I believe, if it's still going ahead, they're going to turn it into a Netflix film. As everything happens these days, it's going to become a Netflix film. And Jamal and Wanda said in a joint statement to a magazine, they said, we're excited to share our story with the world. We hope it inspires more people to reach out and make connections that they wouldn't ordinarily make. We are so blessed to find a genuine friendship brought together by God from a mistaken text message. What an awesome story. I love that story. And we do love stories like that, don't we? We love stories where people kind of are brought together who we maybe wouldn't normally be together. And uh, it, ma- it makes us think it makes us think about how we share meals in our, in our culture today. We're, we're not always the best at sharing meals other than maybe with family and with friends. And so actually sharing a meal in this sort of individualistic society that we live in is seen as quite an extravagant gesture. And when we can combine that, as we talked last week, when we combine that about our ability to listen to people and get to know people, it's a dynamic combination. That combination of food conversation, listening to people, getting to know them. It's, it's a generous act. We're being generous with our, our food, we're being generous with our time, and we're being generous by being interested in people. So there's a real, real power to this. And if we flip it round and we think of the Bible, we think of the passage that we've read, um, we, we would maybe tend to ask ourselves, well, when Jesus was around, how did Jesus bless people? When Jesus was around, how did he bless people? And, and we would potentially, I would automatically jump to, well, well his, his healing, he healed people. Uh, that's definitely a big part of what he did. And he taught, he taught people. Um, there was miracles and he prayed for people and he walked on water and ultimately his death on the cross and his resurrection. But we, we can forget, if we're not careful, one of the main ways that Jesus blessed people was by eating with them. Um, and there's loads of examples. If we look through the Bible, uh, we see a lot of Jesus' ministry was around food, was around the table. We, we even think of his first miracle at the wedding feast. Uh, we read passages where he's reclining at the table of such and such a person. We think even of his meals with his disciples before he, his crucifixion and after his resurrection. I think uh, they've counted at least 10 stories in the book of Luke where Jesus ate with people. You know, we might think of Zacchaeus, is a famous one that Heather mentioned a couple of, a couple of weeks ago where Zacchaeus invites him round. He's coming to house 40. I don't know if you did that song. Clearly, maybe nobody did. I was expecting, I was expecting more of a response. Maybe, maybe I didn't sing it very well. Very Scottish song about Zacchaeus uh, inviting Jesus to his house. And uh, we've got the story of Matthew that we, we read today. There's a high ratio a high ratio of examples. So that means when there's a high ratio of something in the Bible, that means that we take note of it. We think, oh, there's something interesting about that. Actually, um, there's something that we need to think about. There's something we need to focus on when we see that. And why is that? Well, when we eat together, and I believe when we eat together, it's about more than just a meal. The writer, author Henry Nouwen says, when we invite friends for a meal, we do much more than offer them food for their bodies. We offer friendship, fellowship, good conversation, intimacy, and closeness. When we say, help yourself, take some more, don't be shy, have another glass, we offer our guests not only our food and drink, but also ourselves. So simply put, eating with people is highly relational. When we eat with others, we we get more involved in their lives, don't we? We get more involved, and I believe this morning that God wants us to get more involved in people's life. God wants us to get more involved. Why should we get more involved? Well, part of being involved in people's lives is that we're actually reflecting the very character of God, aren't we? Because when we think about God, who God is and how God acts, God is a God who gets involved in our lives. When we think about, we're coming up, I know it's early to be talking about Christmas, but we talk about Emmanuel, God with us. You know, we we don't have a distant God who stays far away. We've got a a God who comes close. And when we think about the Great Commission, Jesus came to his disciples and he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go. So that it's an active thing. You know, we need to get 
involved. You know, somebody, uh, some great spiritual speaker, I think, once said that there's two things that we can do on earth that we won't be able to do in heaven. And one of them is sin, and one of them is tell people about Jesus. Now, I know there's others like getting married and watching Netflix, but the point he's making is, you know, if, if we certainly can't sin in heaven, and we won't need to tell people about Jesus in heaven, and the question is then asked, well, which one of those do you think God wants us to do now? You know, simply put, which one of those do you think God wants us to be involved in now? So we need to get involved. God got involved in our lives through supernatural means, but often through other people. And we see that we need to be involved. And we see in the early church as well, when you think of the early church, um, they were initially in Jerusalem and they were meeting at the temple and then an amazing thing happened. Well, it was, a, it was a difficult thing because it was persecution and they were scattered. But that scattering was one of the, the greatest things that could have happened, you know, through that persecution because it got the word of God and the people of God out into communities, out into other towns to speak to people about God. So it's God's plan, isn't it, that we get involved in other people's life. Um, our faith, our walk with God, isn't an armchair sport. It's a getting out there on the field sport. It's a contact sport. And eating with people is one. And inviting them to gather them, gather round our table, is a powerful, powerful way. And one of the best ways that we can involve people in our lives and we can get involved in others' lives. So get involved. That's the first thing we need to think about. The second thing is this. We need to be open. We need to be open to who could be at the table. And when we think about the passage that we've read about Matthew, it talks about Jesus having dinner at his house and many tax collectors and sinners uh, being there. And, and Jesus received a lot of criticism for who he spent time with. That's one of the things that you see. The religious elites were very, very critical about who Jesus hung about with. And, and as we look through the Bible, it was almost like his reputation was defined by those people. It was almost a scandal to these religious leaders that Jesus would choose to spend time with some of the people that he spends his time with. And Matthew was one of those. Matthew was one of the recipients of Jesus spending time and being open to spending time with somebody a bit different, a bit looked down on, a bit on the fringes. And I think it's amazing when we look at Matthew who became one of Jesus' disciples that Jesus saw beyond he saw something beyond the person's situation, beyond their circumstances. He saw what they could be. And I pray that we would have that kind of vision when we look at the world around us. We would see that we would have a vision for people that sees maybe beyond their circumstances, that God implants something in us, that when we look at that person, we think, there's more to you. God, there's potential in your life if I can connect you with Jesus. And, and I love the fact that Jesus sort of confounded expectation. It's one of my favorite things about Jesus you know, that, that his behavior raised people's eyebrows, made people kind of question what he was doing. And it made me think, you know, when was the last time that I did anything that might have caused somebody to maybe raise an eyebrow for, you know, for Jesus? When was the last time I did something in the kingdom, in a kingdom sense, that might have caused one or two people to go, oh, that's interesting, that's interesting. So I want to challenge you today, I want to encourage you and inspire you by looking at Jesus' life. Uh, that he was willing to cross sort of social boundaries, boundaries of etiquette, class boundaries, to reach out to people. You know, he, he, Jesus did clearly care for the poor and the marginalized, but not exclusively. You know, Jesus' tax collectors were very well-off people. They had loads of money because they'd been creaming it off other people. But they weren't popular, they were ostracized. And I think we need to look at the world round about us and ask God, you know, wh where do you want me to be? Where have you placed me? Who do you want me to reach out to? You know, there's a lot of lost and needy people across the full spectrum of society. You know, even when I look at, uh, I went on to LinkedIn the other week, I, I go on about once every six months. But even through something like that, a social network that's designed for successful, inspiring business people, you still see, you can reading between the lines, you see people who, who need, uh, are looking for attention, people who are looking for meaning, people who are looking for purpose in life, they're all out there. And we need to be good at being open then to who could be at our table, who is around us. And we also need to be open to whose tables that we could be around. We need to be people who are 
perhaps willing to accept invitations that, that may not be, that may be a wee bit outside of our comfort zone. And we see Jesus doing a great job of that, don't we? We, we, we need to understand the power if somebody invites us into their home or, or for, a, for food or for drink, that they are inviting us into their life. They're inviting us into their circumstances. They're inviting us into their joy, maybe into their pain, into their happiness, into their sadness. And I would say to us, let's not shy away from that. We, we, we sometimes like, and I'm the same, we like to sit in the house because it's safe. It feels safe in the house. But God is calling us to a world out there, a world of needy people who need to know about him and, and, and engaging in people in a, such a good way, sitting down and eating with them is such a powerful way to initiate that, isn't it? We need to keep our tables and our hearts open because it's great, it's great to see family. It's great to see friends. Jesus did this too, you know, he spent time with family and friends in the Bible. And it's great to spend time with each other as a church family. You know, you're all great folks and it's great to spend time with you. But we need to get some balance here because we have to involve others. Because we, if we just spend time with ourselves, you know, we're going to see each other for the rest of eternity. You know, whether you like it or not, you're stuck with me for the rest, <laughs> the rest of eternity. I'm sure I'll be in a bit better shape with them. But, you know, so we have to, it's good to spend time together. It's good to fellowship, encourage each other. But we can't just be hanging about with each other all the time. Paul, when he's writing to the church in Rome, he says, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And if we follow that logic, how can we tell them if we don't spend any time with them? How can we tell them if we don't spend any time with them? So we need to be good at accepting invitations, about making invitations. I, I, I said to Janie recently, I can't remember what it was, but it was a, a chat about doing something or a, that I might go to something and make new friends. That was a chat. You know, if you go to this thing, you might, you might meet new friends. And I remember saying to Jenny, you know, I've got friends. I, I, don't, I don't need any more friends. You know, I, I've got friends and I like them. But that, I, I've, I've reflected on that and think, that's, that's wrong. You know, I need to be open to God connecting me and new friendships. You know, just because I've got some friends that I like and I like spending time with, doesn't mean that God hasn't got some people out there that he would really like me to connect with. So, so that's just a wee example from my life. You know, I, I, I was going to go down a route of talking about the story of the Good Samaritan, and I do recommend you read it because it's got a lot to say on this. But the, the interesting thing when I reread that this week, because it, it, it's, the story is... The Good Samaritan is triggered by somebody asking Jesus a question, who is my neighbour? You know, and, and we might be asking that, who is my neighbour? But the interesting thing about the story, and there's loads of sermons in it, but one of the unexpected twists of it all is that it starts off with that question, who is my neighbour? But by the end of it, Jesus has flipped the whole story round to actually asking the person, who are you proving yourself to be a neighbour to? So Jesus flips it around, the whole thing, and rather than say, well, who's my neighbour? Jesus said, well, who are you being a neighbour to? And I think we need to remember that. You know, loving our neighbour is more than just loving the people who we like and who are around us. You know, anybody can do that. It's more than just loving people who will love us back in return. Because again, that's just what most people do anyway. We're to be set apart. We're to be different. We're to be more like that. We're to be like Jesus. And the need is there. Can I just tell you some stats um, that I figured out? You see, because we, 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 we may think that in this world that we live in, we're all super connected online, mobile devices, FaceTime, all these other things. But I wonder if actually in many ways, we're, as much as we're digitally connected, we've lost the art of real connections with people. And a survey from the Mental Health Foundation in Scotland, this is a survey from this year of 1,000 adults, 25% of them said they felt lonely some or all of the time over the previous month. More than a quarter said that they felt ashamed about being lonely. More than a third of adults in Scotland, nearly 40%, said they would never admit to feeling lonely. Almost a third said that feelings of loneliness have had a negative impact on mental health. More than half said that feelings of loneliness 
uh, they hide from other people. And one in three said that feelings of loneliness made them feel worried or anxious. And one in seven, that's 14%, said that feelings of loneliness have led to suicidal thoughts and feelings. So there's an insight uh, from very recent data. And if you want to drill down into some specifics here for some more clues, the Mental Health Foundation gives us, us some, some particular groups that they, through the survey, have identified as being especially likely to feel lonely. They include young adults aged 16 to 24, people with existing mental health problems, and people from some minority ethnic groups. And some other groups were older people, people living with long-term health conditions, people who are unemployed, and people who identify as LGBTQ+. So this, these, are, these are real data, real examples, painting a picture of what is outside your front door, of what is outside this community centre. So the need is there. And it was very interesting that during our community consultation that we did, loneliness was one of the things that we feel that God spoke into us, spoke into that process. So we're going to be doing stuff on that. But I want to encourage you that there are people out there who would really love to connect with you and you would be a blessing to them. Last of all, last of all, we need to be available. We need to be available for this. We need to create time and space at the table. This is a practical thing. You know, it's a busy world. We're probably all quite busy people. And if we're going to do this, if we're going to make this work, it's not just going to happen. It's not just going to happen magically. We're going to have to be intentional about it. We're going to need to make time and space at our tables or time and space to be available at other people's tables. And in the blessed book, there's a handy diagram um, where they, they show that there's 21, weeks in a, uh, 21 meals in a normal week. They sort of divide it up like that and they've put an extra row for coffees as well. So that really what they're saying is in a normal week, there's 28 opportunities to invite people. And they say, well, why don't you just think about filling one or two of those slots in the week ahead? And now, if, if you're like me, my diary probably next week and the following week are already busy. So you're maybe going to have to think two or three weeks ahead here and start thinking about week three. Maybe you're good. Maybe next week you've got some, some time in your schedule. But you're going to have to be ahead of the game. And you're going to have to keep some space in your diary. I love that word margin. We need to keep a bit of margin in our lives. I believe that our lives are quite often filled to bursting with stuff. And if we've got no margin in our lives, then there's not really much opportunity for God for us to take those opportunities or make those opportunities to bring people in. You know, I'm always, I think there's a, it's a, it'd be a really interesting study to look at Jesus' life because it was clear to me that Jesus had a plan, Jesus had a strategy for, and he accomplished everything that he needed to do. But it's also clear from Jesus' life that he had room to be interrupted. He had room in his schedule where he was able to be interrupted by God appointments. So practically, we need to make space. We need to make sure that we are, have availability for these opportunities coming up. Some other practicalities to think about. Well, we may be thinking, well, things are super expensive just now. But I would encourage you, you just keep it simple. It doesn't have to be a seven-course meal unless you're inviting me around. Um, seriously, keep it simple. Some soup, some bread some coffee, some cake. This doesn't have to be a break in the bank exercise. I'd also like to say the practicalities, don't underestimate your home. Don't underestimate the power of inviting people into your home, into your own atmosphere, into a place that's a welcoming place, bringing people into your culture. Don't worry about your home being perfect. Don't worry about having to paint the walls. You could run around with a hoover if you want, but you know, don't worry. You know, your home doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect to make this happen. You know, um, Matthew wasn't the finished article when he invited all his pals around to meet Jesus. You know, was he? Zacchaeus wasn't either. We don't have to be perfect to be involved in this. We're inviting people in. We're living life with them. If you really don't like your home, then go out for a coffee. You can go out for a coffee, go out for a meal. If, if, if finances are tough, there are, there'll be things on in your community, potentially. You can invite people in. There's a community down in Burnbank, the hub that we help out with on a Friday from 10 to 2. Uh, two. You can get a free bowl of soup over there, a cup of coffee. You can invite somebody to come along to that. 
There's always a way. There's always a way. If our heart is to do this, then we will find a way to do it. And also, we don't have to do it alone. You know, if you're a bit worried, hey, I'm not sure about doing this alone, bring other people into it. Bring your friends into it. Bring your life group into it. You know, with, with certain people, you're maybe going to have to exercise wisdom. I, I'm, not, I'm not advocating just inviting anybody into your home if you don't know them. Please do use wisdom and discernment. Please do have other people there if it makes you, if it helps support you. You know, and, and, and above all, we're partnering with God in this. We're partnering with his Holy Spirit. We're looking for the opportunities that he is putting before us and we're praying that he will bless those opportunities. Also, practically, let's, Let's just get to know people. Of course, we're going to want to share. We're going to want to talk about Jesus to them. But when Jesus went to Matthew's house, we're not seeing a record that he stood up and did a big preach to them. We're not seeing a record that he did a giant Bible study with them. I'm not saying that he, he didn't say anything. Interestingly, the only commentary of Jesus speaking is, is a rebuke to the religious leaders who are criticizing who he's hanging about with. He was there. He was spending time he was talking to them. So when, when you invite people around, you don't have to stand up in your kitchen chair and preach a gospel message to them. Just invite them around. Just get to know them and just listen to them. And then we can look at the opportunities to speak into their lives. And hey, look, there's so much more I could say. And if, you, if you're stuck for topics of conversation, the book's great. You know, it, it gives you, it says the best way that we can have conversation is to ask questions, isn't it? You know, we don't have to fill conversations. Just be interested in people. Where did you grow up? What do you work? What kind of jobs do you do? What do you do for fun? What kind of music do you like? Tell me about your family. Ask questions. Listen. Get to know people. You know, it's not, it's not rocket, rocket science at all. I think we can all do this. And we're a welcoming church. I'm really encouraged by the seven people who came to new members. They said, well, it was the way. I enjoyed feeling welcome here. So it's clear that we're all welcoming people. So I'm sure God has got lots of opportunities teed up for us to welcome others. So that's it. What are you waiting for? Let's get going. Let's get eating. Let's eat, everybody. Let's get some pizzas in. Um, but let's be aware. This is about awareness. This is about tuning in for me. It's about listening to God um, and, and saying, God, what would, you, what would you have me do? So I'd like you this week maybe even this afternoon before you rush into the week, maybe to look at that diary, maybe to think and to pray. Maybe it's the people that you're praying about anyway and think, wow, how could I get a wee bit more involved? How could I connect with them over food, over coffee? And let's start thinking practically because I'm convinced, I'm convinced if we get out there, if we get involved, if we're open to who God would have us speak with and if we're available, then God will do great things. Because if I think about what fills me up, I love a big feed. Jesus told a great parable, or he, he spoke to his disciples. After he'd spoken to the woman at the well, you remember Jesus had this exchange with the woman at the well. And he shared with her eh, about who he was. And his disciples come back and they say, okay, Jesus, I think you need to, something to eat after all that. And Jesus said, hey, I've got food to eat that you know nothing about. And his disciples are saying, well, has somebody sneaked him in a, a sandwich or a Greg sausage roll? But Jesus says this, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And I believe that if we are doing the work of Jesus, if we're out there getting involved in people's lives, then we will be fulfilled. We'll be fulfilled in a very different way than just having a big full tummy after our dinner. We'll be fulfilled spiritually will be fulfilled in our purpose that God has made us to be. So, are you up for the challenge? Yeah. Let's pray.